The Wood Whisperer is brought to you by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware, create with confidence. It's never too early to start thinking about holiday gift ideas. So this year, I wanted to come up with a great gift idea that would be easy to build, maybe takes a day or two to build in the shop, something that would be beautiful, and something that of course your recipients are going to really appreciate. So I've been racking my brain and I just can't come up with anything. So I think I'm just going to putz around the shop today and wait for an idea to just pop into my head. So let's get some tools out and get started. Whoa! Who are you and why are you in my drawer? I am the great Woudini and I am here to help you with your holiday gift dilemma. So how exactly are you going to do that? Easy. The Great Woudini has been a great many places, seen a great many things, and it's pretty well known around these parts that he is pretty good with the ladies. Oh, you think you know so much with your, hey everybody, look at me, I can grow facial hair really fast. Well listen up, what you need to do is make something for the woman in your life. Oh, okay, like a cutting board. You already did that in episode 7, you chauvinistic pig. What I mean is something like a fancy box, a keepsake box, something she'll cherish forever. Something like this. You're so smart, Woudini. You really do know it all. Oh, it was no problem. You see, I just... Hey, that was my idea. That was my idea. What are you talking about? No. I am the great Woudini. I am Mrs. Great Woudini. Listen to me, woman. <laughs> you have a big nose. You have big teeth. My mustache hates you. So these are the little keepsake boxes that I came up with. You know, relatively simple design, but things are not always as they appear. These boxes have a little secret. So let's, uh, let's take a closer look. Now each of these boxes are pretty much made the same way, and I'll show you how they open. Okay, first of all, if you look from the side, you might notice that there is a sliding dovetail here, and it's not coming apart. You can't open it. It's because one of these corners Sometimes I have trouble finding it because it's, uh, it's pretty smooth. One of the corners pops up and reveals a little pin. Okay, and that pin allows the top lid to slide off now, revealing the inside, which you could put rings, jewelry, little notes, you know, whatever people would put in something like this. The dovetail male is on the bottom half and the female is on the top. This way, when the lid goes on, it doesn't necessarily squish anything that might be uh, hanging up a little bit in there. Closes very easily. And this guy tucks back in there, pop it in place and it's secure and now it can't open. It was a basic square and all I really did was go to the bandsaw and cut these off as a final step, which if you want, you can get kind of crazy and you could do something like this where I cut twice as many curves into it and still kept the four points using a different type of wood here. But it's all based on the same principle if I can get the pin out. Okay, like so, just a little dowel, and then it comes off like that. Now this one's a little trickier because I came out to a point where the dovetail is. You have to be careful here. I, I want those to remain sharp because it looks better when it's closed, but that also makes it a little bit more difficult to, uh, to secure when you're trying to close it. Now when I posted pictures of this box on the blog, a lot of people wanted to know where the inspiration came from, and I figured I'd show you that too. This is a little sort of Valentine's Day heart box. I don't know where Nicole got it, but she's had it for a while. I think her mom may have given it to her. Uh, but it's really nicely done. The locking mechanism is this heart that pops out and frees up the top lid, which is on sort of what looks more like a jigsaw joint. So. This is a lot more complicated because this is, uh, this definitely is a lot more like a bandsaw box if you've ever seen one of those. The trick here is these are some tight curves. I mean, imagine cutting those out. And I know on my scroll saw, I would have a really hard time making these cuts. And I certainly don't have a bandsaw blade that's, um, you know, thin enough that I'd be able to, to navigate and negotiate these really tight curves. So, I wanted to do something like this without doing this exact same thing and do something that just about anybody can do with a pretty average set of tools in your shop 
And again, this is for the holidays. I want you guys to be able to knock these out and you know, bust five or six of them out in a couple days. And that's what this design is. Instead of that crazy wacky joint here, I just have a sliding dovetail. And instead of the, uh, this elaborate heart, Now when repairing minor flaws and scratches, I usually recommend trying to find a commercial product that's the exact color you need, or at least really close to it, and save yourself some trouble. Let me show you how that's done. This Empire Red from General Finishes is a pretty close match. So I'm really just gonna take a little bit of the water-based dye and touch up those little spots. Before you know it, you'll never even know they were there. So let me just return this to Nicole's nightstand and we'll get started. Now I put up a blog post recently about grain continuity and how important it is to try and match the grain of sides to the fronts. You know, if you're talking about casework, to match the grain of something on the top to the bottom, or in this case, to match a lid to the base so that it all looks like it came from one piece of wood. It's just a very elegant thing to do if you can do it. The problem is sometimes there are just logistic sort of complications and why you can't do it. And this is one of those cases. The bottom is made from a full piece of eight quarter wood. So unless you have some 12 quarter sitting around, you're not gonna have enough material to get the lid. Now you might be able to get the lid from, you know, an adjacent piece of material, but it's never gonna be an exact match. So in this case, you know, do the best you can. Try to get the match as close as you can, unless you happen to have some 12 quarter material. Now, one other option that you may consider, and I'll tell you why I don't like it, uh, is a turning blank. Now, something like this is certainly thick enough to get this box out of there. And you could bandsaw it down to slice the lid material out. The problem that I have with this, though, is it's very short. And when I go to plane this or run it through a drum sander or really process it in any way, this is just too short to work with. And I still need to make a lot of cuts and do a lot of things to this before I get it into this size and shape. So what I usually like to do is start with my material about twice as long. I do enough material to make at least two of these boxes so that my pieces that I'm working with are at least 12 inches long. And then this way it can safely travel through pretty much any tool I have in the shop. So that's why I am not gonna be using something like a turning blank. And I'll try to find the best material match that I can and grain match that I can, but I you know, warn you ahead of time, I am going to break one of my own rules, which is to, to try and get that grain matching going simply because of the material limitation that I have. I'm gonna use a separate eight quarter piece for the bottom and a separate four quarter piece for the tops. I'm starting with enough mahogany here for two boxes, two lids from the four quarter piece on the left and two bottoms from the eight quarter piece on the right. My boxes are gonna be six inches square, so I rip them to width at the table saw. You can make your boxes as wide as you want, but any bigger than six inches and they start to look a little odd. The boards are then trimmed to length of the miter saw, giving me two six inch square pieces. Now to create the circular recessed hole. I start by marking center lines on all four sides of the bottom piece. These marks help me align my circle template, and when the marks are all lined up, I trace the shape of the largest circle onto the workpiece. Now at the drill press, I'm using a large Forstner bit to remove as much material as possible. If you want, you can trim even more material away by switching to a smaller Forstner bit. The more material that I remove now, the less work the router has to do later. And speaking of routers, I chuck up my best pattern bit and get ready to do the routing. The circle template is attached to the workpiece using double stick tape, and I use my bench dogs to keep the piece from moving around. The depth of the bit is set so that the bearing is riding against the plastic template. Since my bit isn't long enough, this is just going to be the first pass. I move in a clockwise direction very carefully. The sharp points left behind by the drill press need to be knocked down gradually. You don't want to take too much off at once, so take your time. After the first pass, you can see that we have a little more material to remove. The bit is now set to its final depth, and instead of being guided by the template, the bearing is now being guided by the wood itself. Pretty cool. And don't be tempted to remove the plastic template. It helps to support the router, and it's a lot slicker than wood. So how deep should you go? I would say leave yourself about a quarter inch of material at the bottom. 
Now I'm going to cut the little dog ear recesses on each corner of the lid. I set my miter gauge to 45 degrees, and with the blade set to about an eighth of an inch, I align the fence so that it yields an approximate one inch triangle on the corner of the workpiece. I take numerous light passes and clear away the stock. When one corner is finished, I just flip the piece 90 degrees and hit the next corner. All four corners are done this exact same way. So now we're going to focus on making the dovetail slot. The top gets the female part of the dovetail joint and the bottom gets the male. So we'll start with the female. And let me show you real close here and show you exactly how we're going to line everything up. So I've marked a center line on my top workpiece here and I'm going to line it up with the center of the bit. Now the height is set so that I take a maximum bite. I really want the full use of this entire dovetail bit. And what I'm going to do is use my pencil to just kind of carefully trace the shape of that dovetail bit. And even on the top here, I want to know the height. This is just kind of ballparking it for me because I want to know, can I do this slot in one pass or do I need to do multiple passes? Now if you look at a sample from one of the pieces I've already done, I do like that dovetail slot to be a little bit wider than this bit can do in one pass. So we will have to do multiple passes. Also, this is quite a bit of material to remove in one pass. So, you know, for me, I really like to remove the excess with some other tool that makes an easier job of it. And then that makes it a little bit less stressful for the dovetail bit. So let's head over to the table saw and we will remove some of this excess. And before I actually make the cut at the table saw, since I do want this dovetail slot to be a little bit wider, I'm going to use my bevel gauge, set it approximately to that angle, and just kind of eyeball how much wider I want to go. And then that way I'll know where my boundaries are when I cut at the table saw. This is really an aesthetic thing at this point. However wide you want that slot to be. Obviously too wide and it looks a little weird. With several passes on the table saw, I remove a good portion of the material, but I stay well within my lines. Now it's very important to remember, when you're making a cut like this, you really want the bulk of the material to be on this side of the bit. You do not want the bulk of the material to be between the fence and the bit. If you do that, given the rotation of the bit, if you're removing more material on this side, you have a chance of, the, the it's sort of like a climb cut, and the piece is going to, you know, potentially push forward on you. So as long as the material or that, let's say the bulk of the material is always on this side of the bit, we're in good shape. Now, if we were making a dead center cut with one pass, we can go once this way and once that way. And it's probably not going to make much of a difference, but we are off center now because I want a slot that's wider than the bit itself. So you have a choice. Do I go off center this way? or do I go off center that way? And based on what I had just said before, we want to go off center that way so that the bulk of the material removal is in front of the bit. So now after those two passes, we have a perfectly centered slot. And if you look closely and realize, you know what, we want that to be a little bit wider, no problem. All we need to do is adjust our fence back just a hair. Remember, every adjustment we make is times two because we're going to make two passes to keep it centered. Now the dovetail on the bottom, the male, is cut to fit. And the way I do that is I take the slot that we just cut, line it up on the top here. Now keep in mind, I am not making these flush. You do not want those to be flush. What you want is the top of the dovetail slot to be even with the very top of this piece. And that's how we get that nice, perfect fit. So I'm just going to kind of eyeball it here, get a nice sharp pencil, and mark those lines. And also give yourself the bottom border here, too. It's also a good idea if you want to save yourself some confusion. Just mark the areas that you know you're going to be removing with an X. It's actually very easy to get this mixed up. Once again, I'm going to clear a path for my dovetail bit using the table saw. Only this time, I'm going to make a channel on either side of the dovetail. And back at the router table, I slowly sneak up on the perfect fit. 
I can't do an actual test fit at this point, but I can hold one piece on top of the other to see if the dovetail would fit. You're not looking for a super tight fit here. You want a little bit of room to breathe. Now with the male of the dovetail cut, all we really need to do at this point is remove the bulk of the material on both sides. Now I'm going to use the table saw to do that with the blade raised up so I can take one pass here, flip it, take the second pass here, and that's going to leave me with a nice clean line and basically a good mating surface for our lid. Now I'm not going to get it all in one shot. I'm going to have to take little, you know, sort of sneak up on the cut because I'm, I don't trust myself measuring in this particular case. So I'll make sure I cut it a little bit wide and then I'll go back for another set of passes. And if it takes me three or four passes, that's fine. I just want to make sure I don't go too far because that's really going to screw up the fit. Now if you're not comfortable with this type of cut, you can always use the bandsaw to trim off the bulk of this material. Just kind of do a partial cut through and then pull it back and then use a block plane or something to smooth the rest of it out. All right, so let's do a little test fit. And that is perfect. We want, hear that noise? You want a little bit of room in there because if it's a piston fit, it's, God forbid the humidity goes up, you're never gonna be able to open the box. So you do want some, some play in there. So now for the accent pieces. Pretty much any wood you want to use in there, you can use. You can go with something that's complementary. You could do something that's completely contrasted, whatever you like. I've got these uh, strip veneer pieces of Azalea that I used in a previous project. Actually, it was Nicole's picture frame project. I don't have that much of it, so I use it sparingly in projects like this. It's really perfect for it. So I'm basically going to take my little strip, put it onto the workpiece, grab a pencil, and mark the location of my triangle. Now, if I'm careful about it, I can actually space the triangles so that when I flip it over, I get the other ones from the other side because the triangles can kind of can nest with each other. And then I just make a couple cuts at the bandsaw to, uh, to release these and we'll glue them in place. And before we glue these into place, remember, we need to create this little hole with our secret pin. Okay, like so. So only three of these are going to be glued in. So let's start by drilling the hole in the lid. Now when I drill this hole, I want it to go through both pieces. So remember the peg is supposed to go through and lock it in position. So a little bit of blue tape will hold it together while we do the drilling. So I have the depth set at the drill press so that the bit goes well, maybe a little bit over a quarter of an inch into the bottom piece. And using the fence as a guide, you can just line it up, drill away. Now cutting the dowel is actually pretty easy. I just drop it into the hole, put my pencil eh, just maybe a sixteenth of an inch above the surface onto the dowel and rotate the dowel. And that's going to give me a nice pencil cut line. Okay. I'll just use my little razor saw to cut out the peg. Now we've got a little bit of a challenge. We've got our peg, goes nicely into the hole. We've got our oversized little triangle here, and it needs to go in this position perfectly, because if it's not perfect, it's not gonna look right. It's supposed to be a hidden lock, so it needs to be nice and tight. Now the way I do this is actually quite easy. You might be surprised. Some dowling kits that I've seen on the market come with these little alignment tools. Basically, you drill your quarter inch hole, and this would drop in, so your two mating pieces, you just basically push the other piece against it, and it puts a little indentation and shows you where you need to drill to have them aligned perfectly. It's really, really handy. I've Honestly, because I don't dowel very much, I've never really used this, and it just hit me when I had this particular dilemma. I was like, this is perfect for that. So I drop it into the hole. And by the way, I think I got this at Home Depot. This is not something you have to go crazy looking for. And I'll line up the back edge with the edge of the box. Once it's in position, I put downward pressure, a good amount of downward pressure, because I want that peg to really put a very clear mark so there's no mistaking where it is. And when it's done, that is the center point of where I need to drill. Since I don't want my fingers too close to the, uh, to the bit here, I'm just using some tape to hold it onto a sacrificial block. Now remember, we don't want to go all the way through we want to make sure it goes down far enough that the uh, pin can be glued in, but we don't want to penetrate the other side. Now if we lucked out, this will fit nice and tight. Make sure the pin is in straight. And when we drop it in place, it should be a snug fit with a little bit of friction. 
And that's exactly what we have. Now if this is not perfect, hopefully you have too much material here, which you could just remove with a little bit of uh, sandpaper on a flat, hard surface, and just take one stroke at a time. And this way you can kind of just remove a little bit of a material at a time until it's a nice, perfect fit. So I'm just going to add a little bit of yellow glue. This is going to be a pretty fragile piece. You want to be careful with it. You could use epoxy for this if you want to. But it's a keepsake box. Shouldn't be throwing it around anyway. Okay. Now I'm not 100% sure that that pin is facing, you know, perfectly in the right direction. So I'm just going to clean up all the glue squeeze out as good as I can. Give it a little twist, make sure it's really seated well. And then I'm going to place it in here. Now the key is you want to make sure there's no glue squeeze out, otherwise you'll glue it in place. But I want to use the box itself as something to guide the pin so it's sitting perfectly in the right orientation. So for the rest of these all we need is a little bit of glue and clamping pressure. Spring clamps are perfect for this. Now the glue is dry on our corner pieces and it's time to flush them up to the surface. There's a number of ways that you can do it. You can use a block plane, uh, you could use something like a card scraper, and you could also sand it. Now in this case, it's only about a sixteenth of an inch proud. And if you use a block plane, you have to be very careful because of the way the grain is oriented, it's very easy to chip it out. So I'm not even going to use the block plane on this one. I'm just going to go right to probably, what do I have here, 120 grit paper and just very carefully sand over to the edges. And for the overhang on the sides, a little bit of hand sanding. If I use this, I'm probably going to knock it out, so I have to be very careful uh, if this goes near the edges. So until I get this down real close to the surface, I'm not even going to touch the power sander. For now, just a little bit of patience and some elbow grease. Now my final sanding step is going to require immobilizing everything. So I've got uh, the box together, I've got it into the bench, um, clamped down in the vise, and here is the key. So you want to make sure that this guy does not move on us at all. So I'm going to use a clamp here, and I've also got, you can notice, uh, some blue tape around the side. That just kind of helps things from shifting a little bit, kind of keeps them in position. So now I'll be sanding each side to make sure it's absolutely flush, and also we want to make sure that this end grain is sanded really well. You know, just as a quick aside, a lot of people ask me, how do you know when you sand it enough on end grain? Well, here's end grain that I just lightly hit with some 180. Clearly, the 180 is just too high of a grit for this. So I'm going to drop down to 80, bring it up to 120, and then back up to 180. The key, the thing that you're looking for here on end grain is to make sure you don't see any white. If it looks white and hazy, you're not sanding enough. I'll show you what it looks like afterwards. Now here it is after 180 grit. Hopefully you can see the difference there. Now the idea is if the surface is uneven and there's a lot of scratches, all the dust kind of seeps into those scratches and it makes it appear white. And at this point it's nice and smooth, there's nowhere else for the dust to go and you get the more natural color of the mahogany here. And this goes for any wood. You also may want to consider sanding this up to 220 or 320 and doing the rest of the piece to your 180 or 220, you want to basically have the end grain at least one or two grits higher than the rest of the piece, and that will stop it from absorbing too much finish and becoming much darker than the rest of the piece. So essentially at this point, you now have a finished box. You don't necessarily have to do anything more other than maybe ease the edges by hand. I wouldn't necessarily hit this with a router bit because these uh, corners tend to be a little bit fragile and if you put too much of a substantial round over on that corner, it might just look odd, you know, because there's really not much material to work with. You don't want to cut too much into these outside areas here. So I would probably just grab a, a sanding block and break all the edges and just give it a nice slight round over on all of your edges. 
Also, of course, uh, gently sand the inside, smooth everything out, get rid of any little bit of burning that might be in there. But for the most part, this box is done. Now, if you want to take it to the next level and you want to make one that has a little bit more of this shape, and you want to cut those curves in there, I could show you how to do that, but I just wanted to let you know that if you want to stop right here, this is a perfectly acceptable and very cool looking box. So in fact, I've got two in the works now. I'm going to leave one like this, and then I'm going to make one that is essentially the same shape as this guy here. So let's jump right into that. So after quite a bit of sanding, I finally have my two one-of-a-kind keepsake boxes. These are really, really fun to make. Uh, time frame wise it took me two days, I would say not full days, maybe six hour days, to make both of these, but I was filming at the same time, which really, really slows me down. When I made the prototypes, I got the process down that I, to the point that I could easily make two in a single day. So if you really get the process nailed down, within a couple of weekends, you could make a ton of these and just batch them out for the holidays. Um, judging from the reaction of the people that I showed so far, this is gonna be a pretty popular project. So you know what, have fun with it. Change the, the lid to a different wood if you want to. Try a different wood for the base. Play with the accent woods. There's so many ways that you can go with this. Just have fun with it, and I think it's really gonna make a great gift for the holidays. So I am going to open these guys up, hit them with a little bit of armor seal, and just watch the wood come to life. Thanks for watching. I am here. This isn't working. And I am here to help you with your holiday gift dilemma. <laughs> that was what I want to say. Try it again. And it's well known around these parts that. <laughs> Quiet on the set. I just did. Oh. You're supposed to shove me out of the way, like violently. <laughs> you always see the top of your head. <laughs> Maybe I should lower it just a little bit. <laughs> Listen to me, woman. <laughs> now we have to keep doing something, so keep yelling at me. You suck! I know! <laughs> we don't argue very well. No, we don't. You have a big nose. You have big teeth. My mustache hates you. Your mustache is scary. <laughs> you like it? Yeah. It looks natural. Yeah. Should I grow? Oh. Oh! <laughs> you look good. You look cute. You should grow one of those. Mm-hmm. <laughs>